Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Does intermittent fasting actually work? As many of you know, Allison and I have been practicing various forms of fasting for nearly a decade now, but does it really work for everyone? Does it work for no one? Does it work for women, men, anyone in between? There's so much information, disinformation, misinformation, out there these days, content overload when it comes to fasting, when it comes to eating, diet, nutrition, it's tough to make sense of it, but we do have the perfect guest for you here today. It's the wonderful Cynthia Thurlow, a nurse practitioner, entrepreneur, functional nutritionist, two-time TEDx speaker, host of the Everyday Wellness Podcast, and the CEO and founder of the Everyday Wellness Project. On today's show, we're talking about, of course, intermittent fasting from Cynthia's perspective in her practice and personal life, how to feed hungry kids, the importance of protein, and tons more. Before we get to the show, here's a note that came in from Michelle from the Fat Burning Tribe over at fatburningtribe.com. She says, when I first hit 40, I was in great shape due to my active lifestyle. However, not long after, I was prescribed a series of antibiotics that obliterated my microbiome. It was so bad that it sent me to the ER. That and being in my 40s caused my weight to skyrocket from a lean and muscly 135 pounds to a fatty 150 pounds over the course of four years. I tried every fad diet and exercise routine, from expensive pre-made meal plans, counting macros and calorie restriction, to extreme exercises like CrossFit and running six miles per day. The harder I tried, the more fat and weight I would gain. I eventually broke down and begged my doctor to prescribe a dangerous weight loss pill and conduct useless hormone testing. I was working so hard only to watch my weight creep up. Clearly, nothing was working. I could only watch my health deteriorate before my eyes and chalk it up to being in my 40s. Then COVID hit, and that forced me to take a closer look at what I was putting into my body. So I began listening to your podcasts and reading your cookbook, The Wild Diet, with more intent. First, I started eating a lot more fresh organic vegetables. Then I stopped eating foods labeled with artificial ingredients, gluten, and added sugar. I then decided to increase my intake of superfoods. That led me to your online wild superfoods store, and I began adding your supplements to my daily routine. All of this was done solely to boost my immune system and give my body a fighting chance against COVID. But to my surprise, I began to consistently shed weight too. Months later, I'm excited to say that I am finally back down to 135 pounds. I can't express how grateful I am for the years of content you've created centered around health. This is a pivotal time to implement these practices into our everyday lives. I'm forever thankful for you. Thank you, Abel and Allison. Sincerely, Michelle. Michelle, thank you so much. I know we've commented and, and messaged back and forth many times at this point, but what an incredible story. Yes, now is the time, if there ever was one, to focus on our health. And so often, you actually get the results from focusing on your health, not on the weight loss. So by prioritizing your own well-being, sometimes there can be wonderful benefits that come unexpectedly. So Michelle, I'm so happy that you found your way to us. And I'm really happy as well that you're uh, you know, a customer of Wild Superfoods. We couldn't do this without you. One of the reasons we start, started the Wild Superfoods store was to create to have a way to stay independent as content creators, keep our show coming to you, and also help literally get you the nutrients that you need that we take ourselves day in, day out to help you optimize your health. So we're really excited to be at this point in our lives and to have built wild superfoods. We're still just getting off the ground, but if it weren't for people like you, Michelle, believing in what we do, we wouldn't be here. So thank you so much. If any of you want to help support this show, we're really excited to say that we have a brand new app available on Apple and Android. It's called The Wild Challenge. The Wild Challenge is the name of it. Look for it on uh, the App Store and Apple and Android. We have a lot of exciting announcements, but we're going to be running, of course, challenges. We have meal plans and different sorts of uh, programs that you can sign up for and a lot of new handy dandy tech tools that weren't in any of our prior apps. So make sure to check out the Wild Challenge. You can go to fatburningman.com forward slash app 
That's A-P-P, fatburningman.com slash app to check out the Wild Challenge. And also, if you're looking to level up your nutrient intake, be sure to visit wildsuperfoods.com. Right now, only in the United States, but this is our supplement store, our family company, and every purchase helps keep these shows coming to you. We have collagen cocoa, which is my favorite form of collagen protein powder. It tastes delicious. Check out Future Greens, which is a concentrated superfood cocktail of more than a dozen different organic fruits and veggies and adaptogens in Future Greens. So that is great to have around for emergency preparedness, for backup food, to make sure you can have your nutrients no matter where you are. We also are really excited to say Vitamin D Stack, one of our best-selling supplements of all time, has now been upgraded. We upgraded the potency from 2,000 IUs to 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3. You also get the cofactors, and we were able to keep the price the same. So we haven't increased the price over on the vitamin D stack, but we have increased the potency by 2.5x. So make sure to check out vitamin D stack, mega omegas, future greens, collagen, cocoa, adrenal stack, fizzy C, and vitamin C stack, and probiotic spheres all over at wildsuperfoods.com. All right, on to the show with Cynthia Thurlow, where we're talking about intermittent fasting from a woman's perspective as a practitioner and as someone who does it in her own daily practice, non-negotiable daily habits and intentionally setting up your environment to make success automatic, two things Cynthia prioritizes every day to support energy levels and cognitive function, positive benefits of getting in three to five minutes of daily meditation, foods to prioritize when breaking your fast, and tons more. Let's go hang out with Cynthia. Welcome back, folks. Today, we're here with a wonderful and talented Cynthia Thurlow. Cynthia is a nurse practitioner, entrepreneur, functional nutritionist, two-time TEDx speaker, and the CEO and founder of the Everyday Wellness Project. She also hosts the Everyday Wellness Podcast, which was listed among 20 podcasts that will help you grow in 2020 by Entrepreneur Magazine, and was also listed in 21 podcasts to expand your mind in 2021 by Business Insider. Welcome to the show, Cynthia. Thank you. I've been really looking forward to this. Me too. And we were just talking before we started recording about how you're <laughs> moving right now. And we have recently moved a bunch of times. We're almost moving constantly for 10 years. And it takes a, a giant toll that a lot of people don't expect, sometimes in very unexpected ways as well. So maybe you can just uh, riff a little bit to start us off about where you're at as far as moving goes. Yeah. So we have been in a rental for about three weeks. I have obviously my husband, two dogs, a lizard and two children that we moved. And so being in the Washington DC area, the, uh, I mean, the, the market here was just insane. And so my realtor said, don't wait for your house to be built, sell now. And, and so we went through that process, but I think we oftentimes forget how challenging it can be to load everything that you live with, put it into boxes and then try to move into another space and, and still be able to function. Like it's one thing, you know, maybe when we were younger and you know, you didn't ha own a lot of stuff and, and we certainly have downsized. I, I think it was a really good thing to purge like crazy. Like we got rid of two rooms worth of furniture and I was wow. happy to do it. It was like less materialistic stuff. You know, I'm, I've gotten over the desire to live in this big house. I'm like, it was silly. We never got to spend time together because right. everyone would be in their own space. Yeah. And so now we're in a, a smaller rental and the house that we're actually building is uh, smaller than our, our house we just sold. And so I was telling, trying to explain to my children that change is good. You know, much like anything, we, we like a little bit of stress in our lives. And I, I think this for me and obviously for my husband has really reinforced our desire to live with less stuff. Like yeah. we would rather have substance over stuff. And, and I think there are a lot of people, uh, it, it, obviously not unique to where I live. I think this is a byproduct of this westernized culture. We just accumulate a lot of stuff and then we end up not using it. And so it's very freeing to have to move less stuff, have to deal with less stuff. I mean, for me, I, I didn't have any attachment to a lot of things we got rid of. And I said, gosh, like I haven't even thought about them. And this was, you know, we started purging over the summer. So um, I can appreciate what you're saying about how disruptive, you know, moving can be. And, but I think it's also, it's also a good exercise mentally to kind of decide for yourself, like, what kind of life do you want to lead? 
you know, how do you want to do a leave very intentionally? Because you're kind of forced very quickly to prioritize like only what's most important yeah. and get rid of the rest of the stuff. It's just stuff. It's just materialism. And I'll, I'll be the first person to say that, um, you know, we, we have to focus on what's most important and it shouldn't be, you know, the silly things, the things that aren't really that don't really matter. This year didn't teach us anything. It's like, what do you really value? <laughs> yeah. And they accumulate too. It's the weird, like the gray area stuff that oftentimes takes up the most space. Not the stuff that you chose or that you bought or that you, uh, you know, intentionally put into your life, but <laughs> somehow it just found its way there. You know, your aunt, you know, gave you this couch and then you've got to keep the China in the family. And of course there's the dinner table and all the rest of it, but you don't have a space for it. And then you've got to move. So I agree whenever you're moving, it's a perfect time to, to take a good look at, at things and put them into different piles. The ones that you would put into your, if you were going to hop onto a plane, you only had one suitcase, that, that stuff, kind of your bug out bag for, for the truck as well as something we keep around. But then, you know, there's really not that much else that you use. It's usually like 10% of your stuff, 20% of your stuff. The rest of it, you could throw into boxes. You'd forget about it forever. It, although it might warm your heart to see some of this stuff when you unpack all those different old pictures and the things that have sentimental value. There's definitely something to be said for that. So something that my dad told me is keep, <laughs> keep very few treasures, but keep them around you you know, and, and, and help let them improve your life and kind of remind you who you are. Yeah. Well, for me, like I've always been someone that really values photos. And so that's always been a big part of what's around us, but even realizing that of the photos I had, it's like, how many of these do I really like bring back joyful memories and really ensuring that, uh, anything that we are choosing to keep out right now, cause most of it's in storage anything we're choosing to keep out, ensure it's something that we love. And then we're, we're actually deciding to downsize more. We're like, okay, what are we using right now? What are we not using? And I think it's been a really good exercise because my kids had much bigger bedrooms than our other house. And so in the rental, it's been, per it's perfectly sized, but they actually like, you know, I actually like my room smaller. It's cozier. Right. Right. And so that was interesting to hear from them, even having that awareness that there's been this energetic shift in our lives in a really beneficial way. And, I just kept saying, I would rather we make these changes now than have you guys go off to college in a few years. And mm -hmm. then your dad and I are looking at each other going, what do we do with all this space? Like we don't even use this space. Yeah. So uh, that was one of the, the reasons to have a little more input on the house we're building is every room has a purpose. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no like extraneous rooms anymore. It's like really every bit of the house we will use. And that's really exciting as opposed to just I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of people go through this and, and I'm not being critical. I mean, I myself did, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, very influenced by the mom groups I hung out in. And there's just a lot of people who I suspect live far beyond their means. And so you felt this external pressure, like maybe I need to be doing this or maybe I need to be doing that. And now I'm realizing it's like, be true to who you are, you know, keep your values aligned to where they need to be in your relationships with others. And as I've always said, 2020, if it hasn't reprioritized uh, the way we want to live our lives, we're, we're not paying attention to the lesson that's here amongst many other lessons. But, you know, certainly, you know, what are your core values? You know, who do you want to spend time with? Uh, because we're just not able to do the, a lot of the things that we enjoy doing right now. So our new normal is a lot of togetherness, a lot of family togetherness. Well, and also living within your means is comfy. That's pretty cozy, too, compared to the alternative it doesn't matter how much stuff you have. And, and I have many friends who have been fortunate to make millions. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you can hear echoes in your house if you still feel lonely. Like, it doesn't matter how many cars you have or how big all this stuff is. And oftentimes, we overestimate how much room we'll need for a lot of these different things. And we overestimate using the dining room, for example, where it's just like no one ever goes in there in most houses. A lot of these other rooms, no one ever goes and you spend 80% of your time in just a couple of little rooms. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I, I'm totally with you. It, I think it's good, especially now that, that people do have the option to kind of like try on different houses, residential houses with Airbnbs and vacation rentals. We've definitely done that a lot. Uh, Allison and I have been very surprised by how little we liked the biggest, fanciest places and how much we like kind of the the ones that aren't over the top. They're more just like little artist studios or little cabins or something like that. The feeling where you don't it's not like being in a museum, 
museum where you can't get dust or a little smear on anything. You can't touch anything. It's more cozy. It's like you feel like living there. You feel like connecting with people there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because I have family members who are downsizing. Like my mom retired and, and she and my stepfather bought a place in Maryland and their their place in Michigan has not yet sold. I think Michigan's been a lot of the Midwest states that were really shut down. Uh, unfortunately, they'd put their house on the market. And my mother has the kind of home that's like a museum, like you could eat off the floors and everything's yeah. perfect. And she's been trying to give us, you know, Waterford Crystal and all these things. I said, I, I don't know what to do with it. And she's like, what do you mean? And I said, we don't entertain like that. Like we're just not that formal and, and there's no criticism. It's just, that's not stuff that we would use or enjoy. And uh, I, I think there are definitely people where it's this conspicuous consumption where they feel like they need more and more and more. And then they get to a point in their lives where they're downsizing or they've retired or something else has gone and they're just surrounded by stuff that no one wants and they can't get rid of. And I, I think that has to be really challenging to kind of navigate. It's like I, I spent a lot of money on things that, you know, don't really matter uh, in, in the grand scheme of things. So it, it's been interesting watching both my parents, who are both divorced, divorced and downsizing in the last year and a half. And they just couldn't kept trying to give us stuff. And we're like, nope. I said, if you give it to me, I'm just going to donate it. So if you want me to help you do that, I'm happy to do it. But I don't want your stuff. I mean, I love you, but I don't want your stuff. <laughs> right, it doesn't right. mean anything to me. <laughs> so... And it's so important, especially now when so many of us are, are working from home, living at home, teaching at home with kids at home, all of this to set up our little environments, our little corner of the room, our offices, our studios, our bedrooms, whatever it is, in a very intentional way, in a way where you're you're hopefully in a positive space and you're able to get work done. That's what I do with my studio. It's got music stuff. It's got video stuff. It's got all my blue blocking glasses and my little heater. And I know exactly where everything is, but I've had to redo this every time we move every single time. And that's where you lose track of your positive habits. Most of the time, that's where you lose track of things and you don't set that up again. So what have you been able to do or, or what recommendations do you have for other people who are kind of on the move, but then, you know, it's easy not to go for your morning walk or you can't work out because the weights aren't there. You don't have your kettlebells or whatever it is. What's your recommendation for people to, to stay on track as your, as your environment changes around you? Well, there, there are things we can control even when there's a lot that's in flux. And so Daily exercise is non-negotiable, and certainly COVID has demonstrated this for me because we had months and months and months we couldn't go to the gym. Yeah, and so I can get a pretty intense hit workout in at home, or um, you know I walk every day, so that's always part. Even if it's a mile or two, I mean every day with the dogs, they love it. I get well, not right now because it's overcast, but getting you know getting out in nature and getting sun exposure. I would say you know even being mindful of sleep. It's so easy for us to you, we can, there's always more work. Like the work is never going away. So I always remind people, you know, the self-care piece is critical that I make sure the two things I do every day, every day I exercise every day, I, I make sure I get good quality sleep because that allows me to be more present. Mm -hmm. And then I'm a huge fan of intermittent fasting. So for me, that's always at the forefront. And even when we were moving, making sure if I couldn't get like a decent meal, I would either order some meals from like a clean delivery service or just having, um, you know, like a clean food option. Like maybe I didn't have the ability to sit down for a big meal, but I'm going to have a clean protein bar, which I generally don't like to do, uh, or making sure I've got hard boiled eggs or just things I can grab and go. So, you know, for me, setting me up for success is making sure I've, I'm kind of like a plant. I've been watered. I've had food, yeah. I've had sleep, I've had some sunlight. I mean, if I do those things, I can generally handle just about anything uh, that comes my way. So th that, and I would say probably the last thing is, you know, three to five minutes of meditation. You know, everyone has, even in the busiest of schedules, kind of keeps me in the right mindset and, and reframing, you know, negative thoughts when they pop up, like certain words, I refuse to say the word crazy and use it in the context of my life because you know, that, that energetic kind of flow associated with that word just kind of scatters my energy. So it's like, okay, let's reframe this. Yeah. So we start having negative thoughts, negative intrusive thoughts. How do we reframe it and kind of put a positive spin? Because I just think that's really important. I'm very protective of how I, how I speak and the things I choose to say and think, because it has such a strong and profound influence on us. It does. It does. We don't, always notice it but whether it's in music or in the way that you speak these different words like 
<laughs> break a leg is a common cliche, but we say he just murdered, he just killed, especially in the artistic, creative, comedic communities. Some of those have the worst language in terms of mental health. You see that show up in their lives too, but we all have the ability to, to some degree, program the way that we behave subconsciously through our speech and, and through these intentional uh, uses of these different words and phrases that pop up all the time because a lot of times it just comes out of your mouth automatically you're not intentionally doing it but you do if you take a step back have the ability to break some of these patterns and i've, I've tried to do that as well like take take the kill and the murder out of it's uh, it's unnecessary you, we don't need to say it that way there are sometimes more fun ways to talk about all this but let's talk about fasting because i think one thing that gets lost in the mix is even in the fasting studies is that well what does fasting mean <laughs> what it's supposed to mean is that you're not consuming anything pretty much right or at least anything caloric but what it, it has often turned into and i saw a fasting study they said the fasting was was eating less than 500 calories a day and it's like that's how is that fasting um so uh let's let's hear you talk about what fasting means and how it shows up in your life yeah. So to me, it's as simple as eating less often. You yeah. know, the, the average American, I think the study that I, I recently read said the average American drinks sugar sweetened beverages or eats 16 to 17 times a day. So is there any wonder 17 that 17 times a day? Yeah. So is wow. there any wonder why we are, you know, an increasingly diseased and sick culture? So to me, intermittent fasting represents fasting for probably 16 to 18 hours a day when I'm not eating, I do enjoy green tea. So that is certainly fine. You know, bitter teas, let's be clear. It's not the fruity fun teas that maybe you might consume during your feeding window, black coffee, water are all fine. Uh, and you know, one thing that's really important to kind of, um, you know, emphasize here is that there are differing opinions about what people can do while they're in a fasted state. And, and I like to remind people, a lot of people come to fasting out of curiosity of losing weight. Uh, bulletproof coffee, fatty coffees, if you're trying to lose weight is not a good idea because you, despite the fact your body processes fats a little differently, like MCT oil, coconut oil, ghee, et cetera, uh, processes them a bit differently than protein and carbs, it's still calories. And right. you're trying to lose weight, that's really not the right way to go about it. So for me, it represents, you know, two solid meals a day. I mean, one of my challenges is trying to get enough protein in with two meals. So I'm really deliberate about my protein intake. I usually break my fast with um, probably protein and maybe some fermented veggies. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a big fan of breaking my fast with a lot of carbs. I'm generally low carb anyway. And so one thing people are always fascinated by is, you know, how do you feel when you're fasted? And I always tell people like I am I'm at my most productive from like yeah. 5 a.m. from the time I get up until I break my fast. I'm at my most productive, you know, exercising, getting my kids ready, uh, you know, behind behind the scenes in my business. So on so many levels, it impacts my sleep quality, impacts my energy levels, my cognitive functioning. And those things are really important to me, especially as I'm I'm getting older. But, you know, the really cool thing about intermittent fasting is people come to it out of curiosity for losing weight, but they'll stay for all the other benefits. And yeah. so that's kind of the the kind of quick down and dirty eating less often, knowing what breaks your fast and what doesn't. And then just being mindful about the food you do consume. Like one of the things that is oftentimes brought up is people will push these fasts. They want to do a 20, 24 hour, 48 hour fast. And then they're so hungry, they'll, yeah. you know, they'll overeat and then they feel terrible. And mm -hmm. so I just like to remind people, our bodies will let us know when we're kind of ready to break that fast. And I encourage people to really listen, get attuned to our bodies. We've gotten so disconnected from our bodies on so many ways because we're, a, a culture that uh, tends to not to likes comfort, you know, whether comfort comes from sleeping too much or not enough or engaging in, you know, watching too much Hulu or Netflix or whatever, you know, the flavor of the month is. And so I encourage people that, you know, become attuned to what, a, what true intrinsic hunger feels like and recognizing that when your stomach growls, it's cyclical. So if you ignore it at 9 a.m. in the morning, drink some water, maybe have some coffee or tea, you may not get another hunger cue for another hour or longer yeah. and you're not going to die when your stomach growls. But I think we've gotten so disconnected from what true intrinsic hunger feels like that people just eat on demand, meaning it's eight o'clock in the morning. This is when I ate breakfast. I eat, you know, it's 1230 in the, in the afternoon. So yeah. it's lunchtime. I'm going to eat even if they're not hungry, even if yeah. they're 
you know, and sometimes eating when they're they're emotionally stressed or uh, I know we can get off on a tangent with this, but people eating for reasons other than hunger, like for comfort and when they're stressed. And certainly there's been probably quite a bit of that this year for sure. But that's, you know, kind of in a nutshell, the way that that's kind of my intrinsic kind of philosophy and also kind of emphasizing how important it is for people to to be um, very much being bio individuals so that what works for you and your best friend and your spouse and maybe your sibling may not work for you. So finding what works for you. And that comes in terms of, you know, if you're fasting, you know, you're fasting with cycling and windows based on, you know, what works for you in terms of food. Uh, I would encourage people to think more about protein and healthy fats and less about the carbs. Mm -hmm. Um, although I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not demonizing carbs, but I, I think we're a very carb focused culture. Yeah. And so, uh, that has also contributed to a lot of the health problems that we're having. So in a nutshell, that's, that's my general philosophy. And then, you know, from there, like you mentioned this five, two of people eating their normal feeding schedules, Monday through Friday as an example, and then Saturday and Sunday trying to consume 500 or 600 calories. And I'm like, well, you don't really tune, you don't really train your body to be fasting longer under those circumstances. You're just yeah. training your body to consume less food on two days out of the week. And I, I'm more a fan of consistency. I think that's that's better for um, habits and mindset and, and consistency. Yeah, so generally speaking, you're breaking your fast midday-ish? Midday-ish uh, depends. Like I've been experimenting with uh, varying my fasting schedule a lot lately and you know seeing what resonates. So I don't necessarily do the same fasting period every day. And so I'm always experimenting, much like I use the analogy of when I go to the gym, I don't do the same workout every time I go to the gym. And, and so yeah. I think our body needs variety, mm -hmm. uh, much like we don't want to eat the same exact food every day. Our body genuinely needs variety. And, and I think the same way, once people are fat adapted, once their body is really you know, working well at using ketones for, for energy as opposed to, to sugar, it's a, it's a good way. And it's, it goes back to that hormetic stressors or stressors that are beneficial for the body. It's this fine balance between not too much, not too little, because too little puts us in the comfort zone and we don't want to be comfortable because that's not the way our bodies are designed to be contrary to what people think otherwise yeah. and not too much stress. Like there are people who go to extremes and everything and then their body that can actually you make it harder for their bodies to function properly. Really a lot of, more stress on the endocrine system, et cetera. And so it's important to find balance. So let's talk about some of the things that, that do and do not break a fast. Let's start with do not because the list is, is pretty short, right? <laughs> you said <laughs> yeah. bitters uh, or at least a, a bitter tea that's not sweet, um, black coffee, no fat. No fat. Uh, and Minerals but not supplements generally. Correct. I mean, if you're doing like magnesium and a lot of it's looking at the, the, the label that's on the product. I mean, obviously if it's vitamin D, you want to make sure you take your fat soluble vitamins with food and right. certainly with fat right. because it'll slow the absorption. So I generally recommend like probiotics, um, branched chain amino acids, um, collagen peptides, you know, those kinds of things you want to take during your, your feeding window. So when it comes to your fasting window, you have to be careful. I mean, there are certain herbs that we know can be beneficial. So things like bergamot, ginger, cinnamon, uh, cinnamon, cinnamon, as an example, actually, uh, kind of boosts insulin sensitivity and insulin is that key hormone. You know, when we eat our body secretes insulin to move, to shuttle, uh, you know, glucose into cells hopefully not into fat cells. We want to make sure our body's using it uh, to our advantage. But then, you know, thinking about things that are better for that feeding window, and I alluded to a few of those, you know, fat-soluble vitamins. I always say, when in doubt, eat it during your feeding window. If you want to have bulletproof coffee and that's part of your day, I mean, put it during your feeding window when you're, you know, you're really going to get uh, more benefits than during your fasting window. And I think, you know, people just being smart, you never want to break a fast with a bunch of carbs. Yeah. You know, we want to keep insulin as low as possible. And we know protein and fat have a much more negligible impact. Uh, you know, fat is probably the one that has the least impact and then protein and then carbs. But, you know, carbohydrates can sometimes drive that insulin response. So I remind people to really be careful. So, you know, when you, carbs are not bad, I don't want to, you know, send that message, but thinking about things like low glycemic berries and green leafy vegetables or, and squash or sweet potatoes are definitely a better choice than bread and pasta and rice. And I always get hate mail when I say those things, but yeah. 
that's the truth. Uh, right. And, you know, I like to remind people that, you know, I'd rather propagate, you know, research based um, recommendations than what I see some in the fit pro industry doing. And I, I don't mean to pick on them, but I will sometimes see people say, oh, it's fine. If it's under 50 calories, it doesn't count. I'm like, yeah. uh, five grapes will still evoke an insulin response, much like when you when you think about when you go to you know visit your family under normal circumstances for the holidays, and maybe your mom makes this incredible apple pie, and it's the only time during the year you eat it, and you walk into the kitchen and your mouth starts to water. Yeah. And so, you know, you get this cephalic phase insulin response where your body is preparing itself for food and, and digestion. And so I remind people that, you know, things like mint and gum and candy and things you suck on can, you know, do the same thing. Now, I also get people who are paranoid to brush their teeth. And I'm like, unless you're swallowing copious amounts of toothpaste, you should be fine. But you, you just think about it, like whatever is going to stimulate sal saliva and, you know, kind of, you know, remind, kind of remind your body that food is coming. And, you know, chewing gum is a great example. I mean, now we're all behind masks. People probably aren't probably aren't spending as much time worrying about what their breast smells like because we're wearing masks, or at least in my area, it's very serious. Sure. Meaning most people can't be around one another without some type of mask situation. So I remind people that, you know, with a mask on, it's probably less of a concern, but I know that was always a big concern. I feel like my breast smells or it smells fruity. And I just remind them that's, you know, a reminder that your body is burning ketones mm -hmm. um, in response to being in a fasted state. But that's kind of a general overview. There's always, there's always subtleties. There are always exceptions. But I think, you know, some of the herbs that I mentioned are oftentimes a surprise, but, you know, ginger, like I mentioned, uh, bergamot and, uh, things like that cinnamon you can actually consume and, and there, you'll see teas with those things like there's a uh, one company in particular peak you probably have heard of it they have a lot of fasting teas and so they have a cinnamon one that tends to be a favorite of a lot of my clients so gotcha oh so sometimes i do get this question they're like can i drink water during my fast and i'm like yes yes definitely drink <laughs> <Please>. water <laughs> yes i was like please stay hydrated and i think yeah. you know most people walk around completely dehydrated they just don't realize that's why they're tired that's why they have no energy that's why you know they have more muscle you know muscle soreness and so i remind people i'm like every time you go to the bathroom your urine should be clear if your urine's concentrated during the day it's a reminder that you're just not consuming enough hydration and the other piece that I think it's really important and, and probably gets neglected uh, by most individuals is just electrolytes. Like if we're yeah. low carbing it and we're peeing all day long, uh, you're, you pee out your potassium, you pee out your magnesium, you urinate out your sodium. And so that can make a big difference as people are transitioning into intermittent fasting as a practice that, you know, if you don't, if you go from having, so let me be clear, if you're going from a standard American diet, which is highly processed and it's largely not real food, and then you transition to a lower carb way of living, eating more nutrient dense foods, if you don't bridge that with electrolytes, you're probably gonna develop something called keto flu, which is not the flu, but you're gonna feel pretty crummy. You're gonna be nauseous, you may have a headache, you may have no energy, you may not sleep well, and so this is a way to mitigate that, and I think that's really a critical, like, pearl you know we that's what we call them in medicine like pearls are little things that can make a big difference in how you feel and so uh definitely if you're doing water and staying hydrated make sure you're doing some electrolytes and there are plenty of clean products that are out there and then there are products that really should be for the fast for the feeding window yeah and even just a little bit of salt goes a long way for uh for me as a runner who's done it in some pretty rough hot environments we live in the high desert here in Colorado. And I lived in Austin for a long time. And I would sometimes run on purpose during the hottest part of the day just to try to get that adaptation. It's uh, be careful and do it slowly. But uh, if I didn't pay attention to salt, I got into trouble, especially if you run endurance events. So uh, that's one of magnesium, salt, potassium. It's easy to lose track of these, especially if you are fasting or especially if you're if you're exercising as well, if you're on the go. Um, so don't think that if you do this harder and you have nothing more, it's going to be better every time. That's not really how this works. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, a lot of my background was in ER medicine and cardiology. And so I got really savvy with electrolytes to the point where I had a whole system. And a lot of my cardiology patients, their arrhythmias would be provoked, their regular heartbeats would be provoked when they weren't consuming potassium and magnesium properly. And so I've gotten so savvy with it that I have huge algorithms that I will work on with my, you know, private clients and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And for example, like magnesium oxide, which is something that 
we used to write for when we didn't know any better, like about 11% of that you can actually absorb. So getting really savvy and understanding like not all supplements are created equal in terms right. of absorption rates. And certainly for yourself, uh, Abel, I'm sure, you know, if you're doing endurance races and endurance events, you know, out in the hot, dry desert weather, I'm sure you probably saw a huge difference between when you're properly hydrated with electrolytes versus not. And I'm not a fan of dry fasting. I think that's bad. I yeah. mean, I should say there are, I have read some research. It's just not something that I've I've dove into, I, I think largely because I'm like so pro hydration. I'm like, there's so many benefits. Yeah. And it just levels up the danger and the complexity as well. But anyway, yeah, when, sometimes when I'm out here, you can see the um, the Rocky Mountain sheep and, and goats. They'll be by the side of the road up at altitude eating rocks, just licking rocks like all day long, because that that's how important it is um, to them. And, you know, salt licks and things like that. It's obvious in the animal world but really easy to lose track of and also not the same form that you get in all the processed food uh, that we're exposed to today and and to your point as well <laughs> for getting hate about saying that that rice and, and processed carbs and flours might not be the best option for us they're normalized all of all of the things that have been normalized as the staples of our diet as the foundation these industrial vegetable and seed oils that have no business being in our bodies and these carbs you have to realize that just because it's normal doesn't mean that it's okay for you to even have a little sometimes. And I know that you in particular are very, uh, I'm sure you cycle in and out as well, but you're very strict with your diet, a lot more strict than than many people are in terms of what you'll consume and what, what you won't. And so where are you at right now? I know you've been dairy-free, oxalate-free, a variety of grain and, and gluten-free, right? Yeah. Well, it started with gluten free. And then, uh, you know, when I kind of was hitting my early 40s, all of a sudden I was realizing, OK, this isn't as easy as it once was to kind of, you know, do my normal way of eating. I had been paleo for a long time and probably not hardcore paleo, but paleo nonetheless, and just really couldn't tolerate dairy anymore. And pulling out dairy was one piece of the puzzle and, you know, pulling out grains was another, I just didn't feel good. There was a book I read uh, by Rob Wolf, Wired to Eat. And I started making the association where it doesn't matter whether or not I have a quarter cup of rice or a cup, the same, I feel the same way afterwards and it wow. spikes my insulin Yep. and, you know, I just don't feel good. And so I was like, okay, that's done. Uh, and you know, that my functional medicine people are always trying to get me to have more carbohydrates. So I, I deal with squash and like sweet potatoes and I do fine with those. But what happened last year was after I was in the hospital for 13 days, I had months and months and months of, well, many months of recovering. And I just recall my gastroenterologist just saying to me, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. So I went full carnivore. And then I still was having issues with like diarrhea and loose stools and probably TMI for your listeners, but just trying to give some perspective, like even though I was eating an anti-inflammatory diet, I was still not doing well. And so I, I actually did some reading and I thought to myself, well, gosh, maybe it's the oxalates because when you go gluten-free, a lot of people eat more nut flours or like yeah. if you have a dessert, maybe it's almond flour. Sure enough, it was the darn nuts. And hmm. so pulled the nuts out of my diet completely. And now, I mean, all over a year later, I can do like lower carb nuts. Like I can do macadamia nuts, not every day. I can do um, some higher oxalate vegetables, but I, can, I still can't do kale. I still can't do spinach. Wow. I, I just started eating beets again, but in very small portions. And so these anti-nutrients that, uh, you know, oxalates actually are, are, you know, kind of implicated in, you start to understand like once your, your gut has been ravaged like mine was, all of a sudden, you know, if you realize these, uh, you know, this hyperpermeability in the small intestine and once those... Um, those tight junctions open up and, and these nutrients kind of leak into your bloodstream. It sets up this inflammatory response. And so irrespective of where we are in our health and wellness journey, I think it's really important if you're not feeling 100%, if you're not feeling well, if you're doing an elimination diet and you're still not feeling well, it's like dig a little deeper. It's like peeling back another layer of an onion. And so I would describe my diet. I'm very happy in my nutrition, like where I am. I, I am not deprived in any way. But certainly comparatively, if you look at the average person, same age that lives in the United States, they would probably perceive that I have a very restrictive diet. I also don't do alcohol anymore because I just didn't feel good and I don't get hot flashes. But if I drink alcohol, I will. And so I always really? say to myself, 
it, it, it's just, yeah, this is, you know, this middle age fun stuff that we get to deal with. So I like to be very open and say, there are reasons why I don't do certain foods anymore. And I just make the decision if this is going to impact my sleep negatively and I'm going to get hot flashes or I'm not going to feel good, it's just not worth it. And so, you know, in, in my world, I do really well, but to other people perception wise, that might seem a little restrictive, but I, I think in a lot of people in the health and wellness space, they probably eat very similarly to some degree or another. I, I think most people are not doing a highly processed nutrient to avoid di diet because we just don't feel good and we're not able to optimize you know, our sleep, our energy levels, our physical activity. And so I think that's really critical. And, and that's the differentiator for me is that if I eat in a certain way, I feel good, I sleep well, I can function. If I don't eat well, I feel it and I feel it for a while. And, and you brought up the topic of seed oils. And so the more I learn about seed oils, the, the less I want to be exposed to them. So I am that crazy person in the restaurant, which not that we eat out a lot anymore, but I'll ask, you know, what do you fry your stuff in? And if they tell me soybean oil or canola, I'm like, pass. I mean, every once in a while I'd like a French fry, but uh, unless I'm making them from home and I'm able to cook them the way that I want them cooked, uh, when you just recognize that the pro-inflammatory response, but then also the fact that it actually changes the structure of your cellular membranes and the half-life is like two years. So it's not just you take a hit that one day, it's just, it's perpetuated for, you know, years to come and that's disturbing. Yeah, and w when you look around, most people are not doing well from a health perspective, no matter what their age is, kids, 20s, 30s, anyone above that, it's uh, also what has been normalized is not or should not be normal from uh, from a health standpoint, looking at what we're consuming, a lot of people don't realize when they're drinking their bulletproof coffee or their fatty coffee or whatever that that fat is extremely calorically dense twice more than twice as dense as as uh, carbs or protein and so if you're going around just following even 10 or 20 percent of what regular people are doing that will add up over time and account for these extra couple pounds that we put on every single year that that all of a sudden is five pounds a year or whatever and then once you're not feeling so good or once you're out of shape it's harder to get into shape and so you might as well just kind of give up that's where a lot of people who you know eventually I get into touch with that's that's where I find them is they're just like well I kind of I tried all these different things but it keeps getting worse and it keeps getting harder so I kind of gave up but I'm doing the best I can and that's a rough spot to be in. And so I think it serves a lot of people to recognize that it is you're swimming upstream. You are you're you have to work harder in your own life to be more specific and intentional for what you want. If you if you want to succeed, because it's so hard now, it is hard. You have less wiggle room as you age as well. But I think another thing that is lost is that a lot of people, especially if they are the ones cooking for the family, they think, oh, my God, if I'm dairy free, then everyone has to go dairy free. And then those people don't like it or they don't need to. And so then they revolt against the person who's trying to do that. And then it all explodes. So I know I, I heard you um, on one of your recent videos talk about shopping for your family at a Costco haul and you got these big old burritos for your kids, which I thought was such a great idea. Maybe you can just talk about that. You don't have to be super specific and dairy free and, and perfectly gluten free everywhere all the time, especially if you're feeding active kids. Yeah. So I think, well, and I think when my kids were younger, it was easier. If I really sure. wanted them to be dairy and gluten free, it would have been easy. But now I have teenagers, both of whom play you know, sports, one plays football, one play, one's a competitive swimmer. And so their appetites are like Real. insane. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so trying to keep them, you know, I, I want them to be independent. So part of them being home since March is that they have, they, they are now in charge of making their breakfast and their lunches and we do dinner and we make sure there's plenty of food prep. So, you know, I, I hadn't been in Costco. It's funny that you watched that video. I hadn't been in Costco for like, I don't know, probably six months. And so I went to Costco and my swimmer could not have been more thrilled that I came home. And so my my like mindset when I'm in Costco or really any grocery store is no soy and no canola. And, you know, both are a byproduct of the processed food industry. So if I find something that's clean and it doesn't necessarily have to be gluten free for them because they do OK with gluten. And in fact, they would revolt if I said no gluten, no dairy. So right. it just isn't worth it. Yeah. <laughs> but I found, a, you know, a fairly clean burrito. I mean, it had, gosh, I want to say like 36 carbs in one burrito. But for active boys, 
who eat a protein dense diet anyway, I was completely fine with that. Yeah. Well, and they so, need it. It's a, it's the opposite problem. It's a battle of caloric load now for those guys. You want too many calories instead of too little. Right. Well, and it's, it's interesting. Like my oldest is five, eight and he's 120 pounds. And so he's got this like V shaped taper, you know, he's built like his dad, but and, and my husband of course, isn't that thin and he's obviously taller, but explaining to my 15 year old, how you want to be getting a good quality calories. So we have, you know, he eats more frequently than I do. He can eat more frequently than I do. And so making sure I'm like protein, healthy fats and a carb, like I want you to plate your meals like that. And they're pretty good. Like they'll eat vegetables. I mean, we probably have five or six options that are available at all times, but trying to, to be all about moderation, not deprivation. My kids eat good quality ice cream. We do make clean brownies on the weekends, but you know, or dark chocolate, which is usually my preference. I'm like, just go have some dark chocolate. But I think, you know, you can't, you can't live in a vacuum. And I'm not naive enough to assume that eventually my kids are going to leave the house. And I would much rather that they have some fun foods here. So they don't feel like they go bananas when um, they're out with friends. But the irony is, is that they've grown up eating really healthy and certainly much healthier than most of their peers. That even, you know, back pre COVID, if they went to a friend's house on sleepover, they always came home. We're like, God, that pizza tasted great, but now I feel awful. And I'm like, yeah. okay, well, it just reinforces those decisions. But I think for anyone that's listening, it's, you know, moderation, not deprivation is kind of our family rule and just trying to find cleaner options. I get asked all the time to go to like Trader Joe's and I affectionately call it Trader Junk because <laughs> so little in there has no soy, no canola. And those You're are right. like my two things, yeah. um, you know, trying to navigate finding, you know, cleaner options for people. So uh, I just think you have to work with your family and not against them. And and part of how I do that is, you know, we'll we'll buy some pre-made things that are clean so that they have the ability to to put something together quickly. And we do a ton of meal prep. I mean, we go through. If I told you how many pounds of meat a week my kids eat bison and they eat salmon and they eat beef and they actually prefer red meat over chicken and and other fish and so yeah, me too. trying to have those things prepped I'm like if the protein is prepped then it's easy because then they can make just about anything with that but my my oldest I think he had um, a bowl of bison stew for breakfast and that was what he had and so I was like <laughs> okay with some sweet potato I was like fine yeah. that's good I'm I feel like my mom heart is full that you pick that and. My kids don't, they don't really eat pancakes or waffles because they recognize they'll get a spike um, in their blood sugar and then they'll be hungry an hour later and then they're not craving good food, they're craving junk. So yeah. even they make that connection, thankfully. And that's why it's so critical that you do prioritize protein. And it's easy to lose track of that too because we kind of need it every day or at least most yeah. days, active kids especially. Yeah. But if you don't have it around, then they're going to be going to the carbs and just being more hungry and, and feeling worse the next day and then being cranky and all that. So really, it's all about having those proteins ready. And it's interesting that you, you mentioned that about red meat as well, because the longer that I do this and the more landlocked we get, the less fish we eat. And, and I don't know why, but the less chicken we eat as well. It's, it tends to be more bison, yak. Um, we have this wonderful, from a few different ranches, combination of organ meats with the ground meats that we like oh, to turn good. into to burgers See, and burritos and that sort of <laughs> that's thing. That's what we need. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, um, my mom's Italian. And so we grew up, my brother and I grew up with my mom making organ meats and because she was a first generation American and she was like way ahead of the curve. Like I always said, my mom was crunchy before I even knew what that was. You know, she had us eating like wheat bread, I mean like homemade wheat bread and organ meats and I'm not saying that I love organ meats. I recognize the utility of eating organ meats, but I usually have to sneak it in things. Otherwise, right. it does not get consumed. So I think that's wonderful that they grind it together. And it's interesting. In our house, my kids really don't like chicken. I mean, they will eat it if it's chicken or nothing. They'll eat the chicken. But, um, you know, the more I learn about conventional chicken, even organic or pastured chicken and the amyloids that they find, I'm just like, you know, it makes me not want to eat, even though it's it's a fairly inexpensive protein comparatively to beef. I'm like in my, it just doesn't satiate them. They don't yeah. like it as much. And so we just, we cook pounds and pounds and pounds of ground bison, ground beef, um, cooking steaks, you know, all different kinds of steaks. We even have done some wild boar, which was interesting. Um, uh, but I'm always trying to kind of push the envelope, find things that aren't quite as gamey. Like we had tried elk and that was a little, a little too gamey it can but be, yeah. for them. Uh, so I, we're always trying different proteins, but I agree. And, and most people don't consume enough protein. And that's 
that's the one thing when I, I did a, a podcast with Dr. Gabrielle Lyons. And so she's all focused on muscle centric medicine. And she talks about, you know, really one um, gram of protein per ideal pound of body weight. And so I was like, gosh, I don't, I mean, when I first met her, I was like, I don't think I'm eating 115, 120 grams of, of protein a day in two yeah. meals. Yeah, yeah. And so now it's like, I will push it. I mean, every day I'm like making sure I'm getting closer and closer and closer, trying to get there and trying to explain to my kids, you know, you're not gonna be able to build muscle if your diet is, you know, 70% carbs and 10% protein and like right. 10% fat. I mean, that will definitely not set you up for success. But I love that your local ranchers have those options. How great. Yeah, some online do as well, which is just it's that has definitely expanded recently. It's getting easier to find ways to get organ meats and eating nose to tail into your diet, even desiccated. At first, it was desiccated liver supplements. And now it's just kind of like it runs the gamut of all sorts of different organ meats. So that's another option. Um, but it's interesting because the organic chicken is something that a lot of people get instead of the red meat because they think it's healthier. Um, but I agree as well, like, and, and even for parties, we need to dress up the chicken a lot more. We, we definitely need to work our recipe goodness on chicken. Whereas if you like we had steak last night, that's enough for it. Salt and pepper, maybe a little garlic. That's all I need. And uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, uh, chickens have a lot fewer calories. If you're trying to feed a big family, um, a lot of times it's going to be a lot more expensive with chicken and with certain things, some types of fish. You kind of have to shop around. A lot of times the best deal you, you'll get is the organ meats and the nose to tail stuff when you meet your local ranchers and you meet your local suppliers or even the online su suppliers now. There's some great ones. So uh, anyway, we're coming up on time, but I, maybe you can just speak very quickly to uh, – to empowering introverts out there because I think it's a very interesting <laughs> time where <laughs> the extroverts all of a sudden are at a huge disadvantage and the introverts are like, yeah, I can kind of deal with this. So <laughs> maybe you can speak to a little bit of both. How do, how do we navigate all of this? It's a good, it's a good way to, to kind of end this. Um, so three out of four of us in, in my family are introverts. And so I think it hasn't been quite as hard on us as, as one of my children. And so it's really honoring intrinsically who we are and as people, you know, either we, you know, kind of get energy being around other people and then we have to retreat and have our personal time. And so giving everyone space to be who they are, but recognizing that, you know, sometimes Zoom calls with family members don't do the same. So ensuring that, you know, my, my extrovert kiddo is able to be around their two other families that he sees with some regularity, but it's, you know, generally outside stuff. And just, you know, honoring who we are and, and recognizing that we're all social beings, but, you know, trying to do it in a way that stays within everyone's comfort zone. Like, obviously, right now, um, you know, I'm totally happy getting on a phone call with family members or doing a Zoom call. But I recognize my my youngest really needs to be physically around people. So making sure that we can facilitate that. So I think it's it's being open and honest about how you're feeling. I think that's really critical I don't think there's anyone that is not feeling the pinch of, you know, this, the degree of social isolationism that we're all experiencing. But I do find, you know, even in our new neighborhood, just getting out and walking every day and seeing other human beings and other dogs that are being walked and saying yeah. hello um, and maybe speaking at a distance. So just acknowledging this is not forever. So that's that's my first piece. This is not forever. This will not be for the rest of our adult lives. Um, fingers crossed. But also acknowledging that we have different ways that we can interact with others. Like we're able to now in our area go back to the gym, but the gyms are like, I mean, it's like a ghost town in the gym, which actually yeah. isn't bad. You know, yeah. so that doesn't bother us. Or, you know, going to classes where maybe you, you're, you know, everyone's properly spaced and you can see people. And so you're getting out, getting out at stores. It's just, it's not the same degree of socializing that we normally do. So yeah. I, I think even for the introverts, we're feeling feeling the pinch of a little less social interaction and, and hopeful that, you know, this will, you know, will come around a bend. Although all my, my people on the front line that are, you know, in the thick of, you know, being on the media and, and, you know, in, in research right now, they're making it sound like this is another year of, right. of this, of this, right. you know, new normalcy. So trying to navigate it. And just, if you're feeling like you need to talk to a professional, there are so many professionals out there that are doing great work online um, or by zoom. And so, I think it's just acknowledging like where do you need support and help and making sure you're articulating it. I think that's really critical. You know, don't suffer in silence is the point I'm trying to make. And the other piece is if you've got maladaptive behaviors, if you've got bad habits, 
you know, working on them proactively. Like I am the first person to say like, everyone has coping mechanisms. For me, I generally try to redirect whatever coping mechanism I have. If I feel like eating something sugary, I'm like, I'm going for a walk. And then almost yeah. inevitably I will forget about whatever it was I was thinking about going to find in our pantry or our kitchen. That's what it's about, it, redirecting it, not trying to squash it into nothing, because that takes too much willpower for us little humans. I'll also add that getting, you know, we, we just went to a little brunch. We've been to a couple of small uh, dinner parties with our neighbors over the past few weeks, and they have been ex way more therapeutic than I ever thought. Even just going to, you know, like a double date with another couple at their house was just, I mean, it, I felt physically different. Yeah, after seeing absolutely. them and hugging them and connecting. And so it's so important that even even if it seems small or even if it seems infrequent, you know, once every week or a couple of weeks it's been for us, thankfully the past couple of months, because before that I was nothing, it makes a big difference seeing people and connecting. So um, do your do yourself a favor and, and don't cut other people completely out of your lives. It's, it's not a time for complete isolation. We still need to, you know, be humans in one way or another. And so we're finding new ways to do that. All right, we're, we're almost out of time. But uh, before we go, please tell folks about your podcast, all of your work, your TED Talk, Cynthia, I, I just love your work. We need you more than ever. So where can we find you? Yeah. Um, probably the best place to start is my website, which is just my name, uh, www.cynthiatherlow.com. And there are links to the podcast, um, my TED Talks, um, you know, media that I've done, blog posts, etc. I am active on social media. So I'm on Twitter, which I know seems to be the wild, wild west these days, yeah. Instagram. I do have a um, free Facebook group called intermittent fasting lifestyle backslash my name that anyone is welcome to join. But yeah, definitely stay connected and, and reach out if you listen to Abel's podcast, which of course you did and do. <laughs> awesome. Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Really, it's a pleasure. Well, hey there, friend. This is Abel. Long time no see. I have a couple of quick things. Number one, thank you so much to those of you who have checked in on us. So far, so good up here in the mountains. My wife, Allison, and I are here with the dog. Things are going well. We're working hard, cooking a lot. And also, I have another quick announcement. We just started up virtual one-on-one -on -one coaching. I already have some international clients, and I'm uh, coaching some small businesses as well. And also, if you'd just like to tip us a few bucks or join the group coaching club, the coffee club, then check out our brand new Patreon channel. Look up Abel James on Patreon, or you can also go to fatburningman.com slash tip jar and find it there. And I'm giving away for a limited time my brand new international best-selling book, Designer Babies Still Get Scabies. You can download the ebook and my audio book for free as part of your subscription to our new Patreon channel, where you can get our content uncensored, episodes of the show, you can get uh, some of my music that's coming out, some live shows that I've never released before, as well as you can ask me questions, get in touch one-on-one, -on -one, and I love connecting with you. So once again, look me up, Abel James, on our brand new Patreon channel, or you can also go to fatburningman.com slash tip jar. And those of you who haven't checked out the book yet, then go to designerbabiesbook.com and take a peek. It might give you some giggles and help you survive this apocalypse and dystopian world that we find ourselves in. So once again, thanks to those of you for connecting. Drop a line anytime and we'll be in touch. This is Abel out. Hey, it's Abel one last time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of Fat Burning Man. Before you go, please smash that like button, hit subscribe, or even leave us a quick review. It helps so much more than you even realize. And if you can think of someone else who you care about, friend, family member, anyone else who might appreciate this free show, then please take a quick second just to share it with them. Word of mouth is really the way that we've grown this show over the years. We have more than, at this point, four awards in independent media, 50 million downloads. We couldn't do any of this without you, so we really appreciate it. If you'd like to get in touch with me, then please follow me under Abel James or Fat Burning Man on your social media platform of choice, and I'll do my best to get right back to you. Now, if you want to keep this show coming to you, you can do something really quickly here. 
My wife Allison and I, along with a very small team, depend on listeners like you to make this show happen week after week. To join our next challenge, coaching group, or get in touch with me one-on-one, visit fatburningman.com. We also make group coaching free with your subscribe and save orders from our family company, Wild Superfoods, which you can find at wildsuperfoods.com. And if you'd like, you can throw a few bucks into the tip jar as a one-time donation or become a contributing member of our group on Patreon. Just look up Abel James on Patreon and you can join in the fun for as little as a few bucks and get my international best-selling book and audio book as a special thanks. You can also find that page at fatburningman.com slash tip jar. Now, a quick disclaimer for all those legal eagles out there. The Fat Burning Man Show provides general information and discussions about health and related subjects. The information provided in this show or in any related materials are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice, nor is the information a substitute for professional medical expertise, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions and views expressed on this show have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, health practice, or other institution, including corporate overlords. We don't have any of those. If you or any other person has a medical concern, I wholeheartedly encourage you to consult with your health care provider. Woo! Okay. Don't forget to join our newsletter over at fatburningman.com. When you sign up for our email, I'll even send you a wild quick start guide along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes, even Allison's famous chocolate cookies as a special thanks for signing up. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week.